read out of my Bible in Genesis chapter 4. We'll read, we won't read the whole text, but I'll read from verse 3 down to 5. And the Bible there says, and, and in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. It is living, it is truth, it is life, it is bread, it is a refreshing. And I ask that your word do so this morning. Let it refresh, let it heal, let it fill, let it satisfy, let it fill every void and every hunger and thirst that we may, that we may have been looking for. I ask that you would touch every person in this place let's not leave here like we came in let's leave here rejoicing and praising your name and with a new hope a, a new vision a new a new desire and a fire within us in jesus name i ask that you would do the teaching this morning we give it all to you in jesus name amen you may be seated title of our lesson today is Offering Our Best. The lesson big idea says, I will offer God my best. And then the truth about God says that God expects us to give our best to Him. I want to go back up to the top with the the idea it says I will offer God my best have you given God your best what was your best or what is the best that you have given to the Lord can you honestly say this morning today that you have given your very best that statement may be true for some people because it sounds like a, a one-time occasion a lot of people I hear say you know they, they talk about times past where they used to pray or I hear people say we started this church and we used to pray all night we used to get together we used to fast and we used to worship and we used to give bible studies i see a lot of saints in our church that used to give bible studies and some people say we used to worship and we used to run and shout and jump and dance and do all these things but giving our best to god shouldn't be a one-time experience or a has-been something that we look back and talk about but our best should be given continually constantly consistently every single day I was among those people that said the same thing. We started this church. I was, I was around then. I, I prayed with them. I'm still praying today. I'm still fasting today. I occasionally still run and sh shout and jump and worship and do these things. I still do it. Although I have many obligations, it seems to me today, I have a 40-hour work, work week that I'm obligated to. I have family, I have kids in my home that I've 
You know, I've got to take care of, I've got things around my home, in my home, I have uh, um, my wife, I have my church, I have duties. But I still make time from Monday to Friday to make my way to this church and pray every day for about an hour. Because God and His Word means something to me. Because God and His Word is what I need, is what I desire. It's not something that I have to do because it's a, a requirement for my title. It's something that my heart wants. It's something that my heart craves. I need to be in His presence. It's something that my soul and my spirit needs more than anything else. I need to talk to God every single day. I need those daily walks with God. I need it. I don't know how else I could survive a week, a month situations and circumstances with my own ability, my own strength. The Bible says not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. I need more of His spirit. I need to be refilled every chance that I get. I need constant interaction with God. I need to hear from God every day. I need to get into His presence and I need to feel His Spirit come over me every single day. Not just on Sunday mornings, but every day. I need His help. I need His direction. I need Him to guide me. I need Him to set the tone for the day coming today ahead. I need His companionship. I need His relationship. I need His fellowship. I need to know for myself that I'm in the right place, in the right spot. I know that what I'm doing is right. Because He will let me know when I go to my prayer closet, when I come here and I walk here and I pray, I know what God is telling me. That is my best. My best is being obedient to His Word. My best is being faithful to Him. My best is me trusting in Him and hoping in Him. That's my best that I give to God. My best isn't proving to people that I do all these things. I don't go out prove, trying to prove myself and prove to people and constantly telling them, hey people, I'm pray, I, I prayed again or I'm praying again or I, thought, I did this, I did this. I, right. To me, that becomes like a chore. How many of you like doing chores? I'm sure we all have chores broken down by the minute to the hour to the second. I know as parents, we love, do, we love making chores, right? Get back at our kids and make them do the dishes and then make them take out the trash and clean up after us and do the laundry, cut the grass, and do the homework. If doing things for God becomes a chore, then you don't have a proper relationship with God. Right. If doing things for God becomes a chore, there is no relationship with God. 
There was no one-on-one -on -one with him. There's no being in his presence because your duties is just a chore. God, I'm going to give you 30 minutes this afternoon between my dinner and my TV time. God, I'm going to give you, I don't think I'll be there at that time. I'm going to put you in between my lunch and my dinner time. I'll give you 15 minutes there because I have other things to do. I'm going to give you uh, maybe after dinner between my dinner time and my me time. And maybe I'll pray to you then. It looks like, Lord, I won't be able to pray today. I'm going to have to skip prayer today because something very important came up. Go back to the truth about God. It says God expects us to give Him our very best. Our best is not giving Him time slots throughout our day. Our best is not situated and plugging in God wherever we have time for Him. That's not our best. Our best is a continual, the moment we wake up, the moment we open our eyes, we should automatically, God, thank you. God, we read His Word, we pray, God, what do I, I need your help today. Yes, hallelujah. Our best is a continual, non-stop flow of giving ourselves, giving, giving ourselves to Him, getting into His presence, giving Him everything for the day. He said, cast all your cares upon me, your anxieties, your frustrations, your everything. We need to have a talk with Him first thing every day. We need to pick a scripture for the day to, to jog in our mind, to memorize throughout the day, to let it linger in our heart and our soul. We need to ponder on His Word all day. We need to sing something that gives Him glory. We need to rejoice throughout the whole day. Somehow, some way, we have to continually walk with Him. A lesson commentary on the next page begins the title of this is The Battle Between Good and Evil. And the topic below it says, What God, God always tells us what He expects. God always tells us what He expects. And He has communicated it through His Word. He's communicated it through Sunday school, through promises, through messages, through examples, through life stories. And those are real stories. That's what the Bible is. But all these blessings you read right there it says all his blessings and promises are what contingent on humanity's obedience his blessings and all the words and the promises and the blessings and everything else depends on you and I's obedience to the Word. Otherwise, it may not happen. It depends on your obedience to His Word, whether those blessings would apply to us. Deuteronomy chapter 30, down 15 to 19, the Bible there says, I put before you death and life blessing 
and cursing good and evil. And then right after that, what does it say? It says choose. Make your choice. Life or death. Blessing or cursing. And then it continues and says, so that thy seed may live also. Down at verse 19. Thy seed. That means your children reap the benefits of your choice. The Bible says, choose you this day who you are going to serve. It doesn't say choose for you this week what you're going to do or this month. It says choose today, this day, who you are going to serve. Each and every day, like I said before we begin our day, the moment we wake up, we have to make that choice. Whether you're going to walk in His ways, whether you're going to walk by His Word, whether you're going to do and follow His commandments, whether you're going to keep His statutes today, whether you're going to follow and remember His Word, His laws and His rules. It's a choice every day. So based on all those choices, look back at your life right now. Look at all the choices that you've made leading up to today. We just read Deuteronomy. It says, if you choose my ways, it leads to prosperity. It leads to blessing. It leads to life and to multiply. So if there's no growth, if there's no accomplishment, if your personal life or things in your home is it flourishing, is it thriving, or is it not a success, then I would rethink the choices that I have been making. It's interesting, verse 19, I'll say it again, it adds, so that thy seed may live. The choices you make are going to be seen in your children. The choices you make are going to be evident, clearly seen in the lives of your children. So take a look at your children. Are they prospering? Are they blessed? Do they enjoy life? Amen. It says a lot about it. That's, that's a lot of responsibility as a parent. Right. Amen. The Bible says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Yes. I want to paraphrase. If you love me, you'll choose my ways. Right. Next topic up there says, though God tells us what is right, he allows us to choose for ourselves. Remember last week I said, uh, God designed a perfect plan so that you and I may know or learn what the power of choice and free will really is. The most amazing gift God has ever given humanity is free will and the power of choice. We are free to choose selfishness over selflessness. We have the power to choose unrighteousness over righteousness. The Bible says we have the choice to either choose hell or heaven. And you and I have this power, this option. It's very crucial 
what we choose from day to day, even down hour by hour, minute by minute. The Bible says the enemy walks like a roaring lion, seeking every opportunity, any kind of sweat or trip. It's very important what you choose to do every day. Look at the choices the people in the Bible made. Look at the people of Balaam and the choices that they made. Where did they end up? Look at the choice Lot's wife made. Her simple instruction was not to look back. But she did. Look at the choices King Saul made. Look at the choices Samson and Demas and Judas. Look at all these people's choices and where it led them. God tried to save these people from themselves. In the end, they had to live with their choices. They had to, they chose their fate. They chose death over life. Every day we have choices. Every day we're like in the garden. There's a tree of life. There's the other tree, the tree of evil, good and evil. Every day. There's a question at the bottom right hand corner. It says, can you think of Bible characters who did what God expected of them and were blessed because of their obedience. You think of any people in the Bible that fits this? I chose Noah. Noah chose every single day to work on his ark. There were probably days where he didn't work, but I'm sure that it was constantly going in his mind, the next step, going over every detail of the work, imagining the finished product, the big arc, and how it's going to be designed, the outside, the inside, every measurement. I'm sure it was constantly in his mind and thinking about it. But every day he went out to work on this ark. Despite all the words of discouragement, all the people probably making fun of him, calling him names, putting him down, and he probably even had days where he thought, you know, this is kind of foolish, odd, I mean, to be building a boat in the middle of a desert with no water in sight. I'm sure these thoughts came up in his mind. But every day, Noah got his sons together. He gathered his family together. And I'm sure Noah says, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord no matter what. Hallelujah. Despite the words, despite the odd situation, despite all the... the, the the attack. We're going to obey. We're going to obey His Word. We're going to follow exactly what God said to do. We're going to do what God says. I'm going to continue to work on the ark. I'm going to build my ark every day. We need to be like Noah. We need to choose every day to work on our relationship with God. We need to choose every day to build our prayer life. That's our only hope. That's the only thing that is going to sustain us is prayer. We need to make it a priority to make time for God 
so that we can offer our prayers, give Him our prayers. We need to build our prayer life. Do we all have a prayer life this morning? We need to choose every day to build our home. We need every day to choose to stand in the gap and intercede for our families, those around us. We need to choose every day to build up our faith, our trust in God. We need to become completely reliant on God. And having said that, we need to let go of a lot of stuff. We have too much stuff that we're tied to, linked to, and associated with, and hanging on to. When that happens, we have too many things to choose from. We created so many things to choose from. And a lot of time, it causes us not to always choose God. We have so many choices that God has placed somewhere we can't even see Him sometimes. He's in the back. He's over here. We've got, we've got to let go of some things. We need to put God back in His place. Priority. Number one. In our life. In our home. In everything. Choose His ways first. Remember His word first. Remember His promises first before you choose any other thing. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse number 15 says, The ways of a transgressor is hard. What is a transgressor? A transgressor is one that opposes truth, that opposes the Word, God's Word. A transgressor is the one that opposes God, that opposes teaching, that opposes preaching, that opposes doctrine. The Bible says, His life is hard. How many of you ever said that? Living for God is hard. We gotta die every day before we make any choice. Moving down, next topic. It says uh, right there. I want to read that Romans chapter eight and verse number seven. It says the carnal mind is enmity between God against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. In order to prevail, we must receive the necessary grace, forgiveness, and the overcoming power of God. We have two ways that we can approach this. We have two different ways of thought. I mentioned one just a moment ago. We can think living for God is hard. Or we can approach it from a different angle and think. Think of it as being a privilege to live for God. Having to go through trouble and trial and tribulation. Because if I make all the right choices going through all this narrow hardship, My life is going to be an example to others. My life is going to make an impact on somebody else's spiritual eternity. Right. Somebody around me, my family, my kids, are going to see my life and it's going to be a testimony. 
My life, my right choices, my righteous living, my uprightness, my holiness is going to make an impact around people around me. And people can honestly say, I want what that person has. You know, I can't express how critical our everyday choices are. I want to read that next. This, this is Paul. I, I was so taken. I, I, I haven't read this for as long as I can remember. It says right there in Romans 7, Paul saying, I can anticipate the response that is coming. I know that all God's commands are spiritual, but I am not. Isn't this also your experience? Yes, I'm full of myself. After all, I've spent a long time in sin's prison. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another. Doing things I absolutely despise. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. How awesome is that? I mean, it's like saying you can only smash your fingers with a hammer a few times and then you learn. It becomes obvious after a few times what is it we need to do. I wouldn't want to go there. I would rather learn after the first or the second time that I've smashed my thumb with a hammer. But to me, that's what the Lord, Lord's Word speaks to me. It says, our well-meaning, sincere, best judgment is not enough. A lot of people live with that mentality as Christians. Meaning well, doing good works, being sincere, having good judgment. It says that's not enough. We need, we need God's Word every day that tells us what He expects. I want to read that body part. But I need something, Paul says, more. Well, if I know the law, but still can't, I still can't keep it. And if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that all, not all my, not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. That is true. How many of you know what Paul is talking about? How many can identify with what Paul is saying? I want to do good, but I don't do it. I don't want to do bad, but I do it anyway. I want to do good, but I always fail. <laughs> I said that my whole life. What is it? How come something's gone wrong deep within me? gets the better of me every time. My spirit wants to do right, but my flesh and sin want me to rebel. And the Bible says there, what's the solution? Written in Romans 7, it says, I've tried everything. As Paul said, nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? 
Isn't, the real, isn't that the real question? The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind but am pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. Even that helps us to bring us back to God. Our wrong choices and the things that we've made that leads us all back to God. What, a, what an awesome design. Amen. We need to thank God for His Word and His mercy and His love. Romans chapter 7 and verse 18 says, There's nothing good that dwells in me. I better move on. Let's move on to the next topic. It says, uh, the rivalry between Cain and Abel. We know the story about Cain and Abel. I'm sure we've all heard it. They both brought sacrifices to the Lord. We know that one sacrifice was accepted and the other one was rejected. We know that one sacrifice was brought in obedience and the other sacrifice was brought in disobedience. We know that one giver was spiritually minded and the other was carnally minded. One giver obeyed every word or instruction that the Lord gave to them, but the other tried to tweak that instruction or that word given by God. We know that one giver offered in accordance to God's plan and we know that the other giver gave according to his own will the way he wanted to do it. The way he chose, the way he thought was better, what he thought was good. That's where a lot of people get trapped. We think doing one thing for God we're good for the next couple years. We think praying one time we're good for the week. We think offering, making an offering one time in Sunday school is good enough. We're covered for. No, it's not what we think. Right. It's not what we think is good. We need to do exactly how the Bible says to do it. The Bible says to be faithful. That means continually, constantly, consistently, every day, every moment. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 5 says, Cain became angry at God's disrespect in his offering. It says that, uh, it seems that Cain felt God was unfair. We ever thought that towards God? Sometimes we think God is unfair. I'm sure sometimes we can identify with Cain's reaction or Cain's frustration. Because we, some, we sometimes do things we think are worship or at minimum are generous gestures. And we wonder why God does not seem to bless our efforts. God is a loving God. God is an understanding God. God is our Father and our friend. But He won't allow, He won't allow even us, His children, to tweak His Word. He won't allow us to even change one dot or one cross of, of any word. There's only one word. There's only one way and that's God's way 
There is no other way. None. Absolutely zero. Jesus. When we rebel against His Word, the Bible says it is like the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is like iniquity and adultery. Idolatry. Those are big words. We rebel against His Word. We don't walk by His Word. We don't. It's like witchcraft. We're doing iniquity, idolatry. I'm not saying that. It's in the Bible. And that last part says, our worship must come from the heart. When Cain and Abel were offering their sacrifices, if there were a bystander, we were standing there to look at Cain and Abel offering to the Lord and them standing before God and making their offering. By looking at them, it will look like they're doing the right thing and it looks good. All the things that are before the Lord, they have an offering that looks good. But God wasn't looking at the scene. God was looking at where their hearts were. Were they half-hearted? Were they lukewarm? Were they coming in obedience? Was their heart cold? When we come every Sunday, when we attempt to do things for God, He knows exactly what state and what condition you're offering Him. He knows what you are offering Him. He knows and sees what you are giving Him. We give to God to show Him how important we think He is. Not so that He can see how special we are. A proper sacrifice is going to cost you something. The Bible reminds me of the Bible when it says, God loves a broken and a contrite spirit. It's only then that we can draw nigh to God. It's only then when we're confused, when we're down, when we're beaten up, when we're, when we're going back and forth. Like Paul says, I want to do good, but I fail. I want to do this, but I can't. It seems like I'm struggling. I'm trying. I'm moving forward. I'm trying to grasp on, hold on to me, but I keep sliding back, but we keep going. And we sin that says sin creeps up and trips us like Paul saying it's a continual cycle. You want it, you need it, you desire it, you hope it. you do try to do your best in every which way to try to please God, to bring yourself to before the Lord, but yet somehow it seems in our own mind we fail. But God loves a broken and a contrite spirit. No wonder the Bible says, count it joy when you fall into diverse temptation, when we're troubled, when we're when the path seems so narrow and dark, and we've got you know the way of the world and things all around that we're lugging along and we're we barely can see where the next step is. And those are times when we completely trust God. Those are the times when truly our heart cries out to God. Those are times when our prayers are so effective. Those are times when our prayers are fervent. When we're going through troubling, distressing times. Amen. I'm so glad for His Word and where it's brought me. I can identify with Paul and you know, the life that I've led led me to where I'm at today. And now I'm going to offer my best. 
Hey Amen. I want to offer God my best. Yeah. I want to live in His Word. I want to do His Word. I want to, you know, I don't, I don't boast saying I come here to pray. I pray another hour, but that's me. That's my time. Right. I don't want to brag about it. I don't want to cheapen it. But my life and what I do for God should display itself. It should be seen in my kids, in my family, in my home, and what I do. Yeah. Amen. Because nothing else is important. Nothing else we're going to take out of this world. There's nothing else that we should waste our time on. Right. Yes, we do have to live life, but that shouldn't be. That shouldn't take the place of God. God should still be number one priority. What are our five priorities? Anybody remember number one is God? Who's number two in, in our list of priorities? Wait, I said God? Yep, God's number one. Who's priority number two? Who? Yep, your spouse, which is your wife. And then who's priority number three? Your children. Yep, and then priority number four? Your job. Because it's your job is what supports the church. And then last on the list, it doesn't mean to discredit it in any way, but the last is the church. But God is number one. We need to put him there and keep him there. Let's all stand for a moment. Thank you, Lord, for your word.